Welcome everyone, Kostin here with a discussion about Total War Warhammer and to talk about the idea of a more limited campaign within the context of Total War. I think, personally, that a more limited campaign or more limited campaigns can work if done properly by Creative Assembly. Realms of Chaos doesn't work very well because they're trying to do everything all at once in Realms of Chaos. Now, when people think about more limited campaigns, they will cite the examples of the Beastman campaign in Warhammer 1 and the Wood Elf campaign also in Warhammer 1 on why a more limited campaign can't work. But let's discuss these particular campaigns because I do have uh, various saves over here. I've also been playing a Warriors of Chaos campaign on Legendary in Warhammer 1. And let's, uh, let's discuss this. What are the pros, what are the cons? So a limited campaign can work, I think, if it's done well. And when I think of that, I think of the prologue campaign, the Lost God campaign, where you have various choices, where you have a strong narrative, where you have a lot of dialogue being recorded and then you hear a lot of it, and you do have various options. And that's a very easy campaign. The reason I think the Wood Elf campaign and the Beastman campaign didn't work out when Warhammer uh, when they came out for Warhammer 1 is a combination of factors, the way the races work themselves and also the way the campaigns are designed. So, over here, I have a campaign as Durfu. This is not a legendary campaign. I'll get into why I didn't play on legendary. Uh, but when you're looking at this campaign, you start over here with the Waterfall Palace and... One of the things that becomes very clear is that you're not really going to be in a position to take a significant amount of territory. So this is certainly a limited campaign where you could even play this entire campaign with just one settlement, one army. In fact, it might very well be designed for that. Now, that's the kind of limitation that isn't particularly great uh, to deal with because we do want to build multiple armies. We do want to uh, get territory. We don't want to play a campaign where we're being incredibly limited to the point that we have no kind of scalability. But the problem over here is that we are limited in that respect. And another issue, and the reason I didn't play this on Legendary, is that while you may struggle to afford more than one army given your economy, like over here in this campaign I do have three armies, but that's like 66 turns in, while I do have multiple uh, armies over here, I've also been dealing, even on this difficulty, this is not on hard by the way, even on this difficulty you can see that the AI, because of the AI cheats in Warhammer 1, is able to maintain quite a few armies. Now to be fair, uh, the Greenskins over here do have two entire provinces and they have tier 4 uh, settlements over here, maybe even a tier 5 settlement in Axe Bite pass over there. So you create this situation where if you're playing a campaign like this, you are limited in the sense that you only have one army, but the AI is still pretty much the same AI as it was in the base game with the same cheat. So it's going to uh, possess an enormous number of forces that it's going to throw against you. Now, I'm all for a challenge, but the nature of that challenge shouldn't be like you're outnumbered three to one in the campaign. And there's nothing you can do to necessarily change that dynamic, uh, especially on a higher difficulty. And you rely heavily on taking either taking territory that's not defensible, because that's one of the problems of the Wood Elves. So, like, the Wood Elves don't take territory. They have these outposts. So, for instance, I have a gold mine over here that's generating 500 income, and that's really helping me out over here. You have that limitation, but you basically have to fight the hordes of hell again and again and again. So on a higher difficulty, it doesn't work out. The problem with a lower difficulty Sunday. is you might just play the entire campaign and not how, not be forced to fight a singular battle throughout uh, the course of, of these campaigns. And that is something that does impact enjoyment, because you have this situation where you're either steamrolling or you're getting steamrolled by the AI. So that's not a great dynamic in general to have, I think, in the course of a campaign. Like when we, uh, like a limit, when I think of a limited campaign, I'm just talking of a more limited map, but it a more limited map, I think, will only work 
if Creative Assembly puts a lot of effort in the objectives and giving you a variety of objectives and different choices in those objectives. That's what the Lost God uh, did. Again, it was a very, very easy campaign that you could do pretty quickly within a handful of hours. Yeah, it's the same situation over here. If you're playing on lower difficulty, but if you're playing on a high difficulty, you end up feeling frustrated because you're fighting the exact same enemy again and again and again without any real sense of progression or progression is uh, is very, very slow. Like, take a look at this World of, World of Campaign. What do you need to do in order to win this campaign? Well, here's what you need to do. You need to heal the tree. That is it. Like, you need to keep the Oak of Ages alive, prevent Mogur, who is the main opponent of this campaign, from destroying it and he'll be like he'll spawn a bunch of armies and then he'll just like spawn one army and every time you kill him he'll just respawn again and again like Mogur is a singularity he cannot be killed he cannot be destroyed and so the what you're really doing in this campaign you're trying to like you actually won you declare war on fellow wood elves because well obviously you do because they have territory you actually want or you subjugate fellow wood elves. So, for instance, I uh, I subjugated this so particular wood elf uh, faction by attacking their settlement when their army was away, uh, took it over. Uh, I also subjugated another faction in the glade of the Eternal Moonlight, but they actually got wiped out by Mogur, so I had to rebuild uh, that particular settlement from scratch. But there's no real objectives, with the exception of like quests for items. There's no real uh, objectives, no real decision making, no interesting things that are happening. There are quest battles, but they're the item quest battles. They're not quest battles related to the main quest, with the exception of the final uh, section, exception of the final battle in this particular DLC. And while sure you might find Bretonia, Greenskins, and Mogur, Mogur is certainly something you're gonna fight. The variety of what you're doing in a campaign isn't uh, particularly, uh, particularly great. So if you had different objectives, if you had uh, different choices, like let's say, okay, you can, uh, you might be forced to go into Bretonia and deal with them, or you might just stay in the Wood Elf territory uh, to try and deal with them. Like uh, one of the ways they could have done this, like they could have had Mogur show up, but the initial stages could have just been an investigation to find out who was responsible and fighting various factions dependent on who you think is responsible. And of course, you find out that, well, it's neither Bretonia or the Wood Elves or even the Dwarves. I think there might be some Dwarf factions actually here that do start, like Carrick Siflin. They just got wiped out by the Greenskins. Dwarves getting wiped out by the Greenskins. We haven't seen that before, have we, in the Total War game? Uh, that could have been a campaign dynamic, like where the early part is an investigation and then you find out the truth of who exactly is causing a lot of issues in Alpha Lauren and it's Mogur and then you have to deal with him and then you have to hold him back and uh, and build the, the tree. Like, this campaign, like the only real limiting factor in this campaign is Amber. Basically, you need to take a lot of territory to gain Amber because the way Amber is gained in Warhammer 1 uh, for the Wood Elves, or until the Wood Elf rework in Warhammer 2, late Warhammer 2, the way Amber is gained is you either gain Amber through a military alliance with a faction or vassalization agreement, um, or you gain Amber by taking territories, like over here I wiped out uh, Paravon, and this is producing Amber for me. So it's like I'm getting... Uh, 17 amber from my own settlements, 19 amber from allied settlements, 6 amber from uh, various events. And most of that amber, the vast majority of the amber, has gone into the Oak of Ages just to, to rebuild it. It doesn't create a great campaign dynamic. But that isn't to say that the idea of a more limited campaign cannot work. It's just the specifics of how Creative Assembly handled it over here weren't really aggravated. If it honestly feels like a fairly cheap campaign at the end of the list. It's like, oh yeah, you just have the Wood Elves, the same race we designed for the regular map. And it's like, we're just going to take that map, uh, the, the, the same race, we're going to make a map, but we're not going to change how the AI behaves. We're not going to change the campaign mechanics of the Wood Elves. And that's also a thing that should be mentioned by a more limited campaign. The campaign dynamics, the way your economy works, the way your hero recruitment works, the way your all that works 
should be different in such a limited campaign than it is on the big map. That's one of the things that they did in the Lost God campaign for Warhammer Free. Like a lot of that stuff, the way their economy, supply lines, etc., did work was very different in, for Kislev and Lost God than it was for Realms of Chaos. Funnily enough, many people I think would agree that Kislev was much better to play in the prologue campaign of Warhammer Free than in up playing in Realms of Chaos and Immortal Empires. But when a race is designed to operate in a specific way for a specific map, just taking that exact same race and having the exact same racial mechanics in a smaller map doesn't necessarily end up working all that well. And to be clear, this is actually the better of the two campaigns that we do have in Warhammer 1 because we also have the all other campaign, and that is Kazrak. Let me just go over Kazrak's campaign. Really? <laughs> Okay, so here we are in uh, Kazrak's campaign. This is at the very, very end of uh, said campaign. Uh, the only thing that I would need to do to... Like, I've already won the campaign here. It's just like the ultimate campaign victory requires me to defeat Hawkland. This is also on the hard difficulty as the previous one. Playing this on Legendary is like an, ex an experience born out of frustration because you... The Beastmen were never that great of a race, even in Warhammer 1. And it's difficult in, in, with before the Beastmen rework to maintain more than one army. And you do rely heavily on regiments right now to make that work. Your economy is not great or non-existent. L lots of issues. So that's one of the things. Like, you see these two campaigns and people say, oh, these campaigns are not great. But it's like the races that are in these campaigns are not well designed for such a campaign. And they work in a similar way. So if you play this campaign on Legendary, here's what will happen. You'll start over here in the Reichland Channel, pretty much in this area. Um, and you'll end up fighting uh, half a dozen Imperial factions. You'll fight Marienburg, you'll fight the Cult of Ulrich, you'll fight Karaburg. And if you're playing on Legendary, like each of them doesn't matter how much territory they hold or not, each of them will be able to produce at least two, maybe even three stacks to throw against you. Hell, it's even ridiculous what they're able to produce even on hard difficulty, uh, though that is certainly something you can manage. I did kind of like playing this in a sense because even on hard, you can't just fight everyone. Like, you can't just, you know, early on, you can't just show up to a settlement that's like, oh yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna fight three stacks because you're not gonna win against three stacks. So you really need to make use of the... Well, abuse the AI in a sense, like abuse your stealth mechanics, abuse uh, uh, abuse the fact that you are invisible, like um, that you're in stealth, that they can't, the AI can't see you and can't detect you and can't um, deal with you, really. That's something that you do need to take advantage of in this particular campaign. Um, but while it can be a bit of fun, like just, you know, destroying the entire map, it ended up like losing its potency very quickly because again the objectives themselves what you're doing like you're doing the same thing over and over and over and over again it's like you go to a settlement you wipe a garrison you raise it to the ground you either go for grow for post battle loot uh, or yeah post battle loot um, and then it's like you're just doing that again and again and again and again and again and again dozens and dozens and dozens of times and nothing ever changes, really. Like, with the exception of the quest objectives, no, nothing ever changes with respect to this. And the quest objectives, uh, the item objectives, which you may not necessarily even care about. Like, I got them over here, but uh, with the exception of the item uh, objectives, there's nothing to change that dynamic. There's no quest battle, even, in this particular campaign that change, uh, like, quest battle related to, the, to winning the campaign. Uh, there's no nothing like that. Whereas you look at the Lost God campaign, it's like you had multiple quest battles over there. You, like you did have a, a one against Siege that wasn't necessarily uh, that great, but the one against Corn that was a bit uh, uh, different. And then of course you had the final battle as well. And then of course dealing with the Wolf, which was a very uh, you know very easy uh, stuff. Like you you had multiple ones. Like you actually have five uh, battles, five important battles uh, in the in the prologue campaign, Lost God, where you have none at all 
in the Beastman campaign in Warhammer 1, and you only have one in the Wood Elf campaign. Now, I'm obviously talking outside of, like, items uh, that you're getting, like the item objectives that you do have. Uh, but it doesn't, again, it doesn't create a great campaign uh, campaign experience because it just ultimately what ends up feeling is a lesser version of the regular map we're, we're dealing with because the mechanics are the same. The this, it's just like a smaller version and you're just fighting Imperials constantly and that never changes. Like, you never fight anyone else. You don't fight Beastmen. You ally the Greenskins as I have done over here. Like, you make an alliance with the Greenskins and that is all that you do in this campaign. You just fight the Empire again and again with no variety whatsoever. It's like they're going to produce the same armies. The garrisons are always going to be the same. Boris Toddbringer is going to show up a dozen times to just annoy the crap out of you. And the enjoyment factor just certainly falls down significantly. But the reason I make these points is like, that's not how it should be. Like, you can have more variety, you can have objectives, you can have story decision. Like, if you're talking about a more limited campaign, I would imagine story campaign. Or if you're thinking about this uh, more limited campaign, one of the things I would certainly like to see in Warhammer 3 is like, let's say you have a green skin campaign. Let's, let's go with an idea. Let's say you're playing Grimgore, right? You have a campaign as Grimgore, and your objective is to topple the Cast Dwarf Empire. But let's look at how Grimgore did that in the lore. First off, he had to deal with Ogre, so he had to beat up Greasis. Then he went up, beat up Drazov, and then he showed up and annihilated Tsar Nagrund. The only reason, by the way, he, he, he did succeed on his own, effectively, against uh, Drazov... But Tsar Nagrund only fell, like, after a really difficult battle because, well, Gorduz backstabbed them, like, they expect to happen. Like, the Hobgoblins decided uh, to join Grimgor. They picked the winning side, joined Grimgor, and toppled uh, the Cast Dwarf Empire. And, like, that gives you possibilities. Like, with, with Drazov, like, Drazov might have defeated Grimgor, except Grimgor was basically a deity at that point. Uh, that toppled the walls of the Black Fortress, despite Drazov's artillery. But you could have this interesting campaign dynamic or a battle dynamic in, in such a campaign, like just the idea of it. Like when you're dealing with Greasis, like you're just building up the forces. You're in, actually, Grimgore started, up, uh, started out by unifying various Greenskin tribes, then going to beat up Greasis. So like you would then early stage would be dealing with Greenskins, unifying them, fr uh, building a massive army. And then you get to deal with Greasis and Scrag. By the way, he also killed Scrag, as far as I know. Because both of them refused to bend the knee, so to speak. And then all of the ogres, like, you could have that situation in a camp. Like, let's say Greasis starts with a lot of territory, and he's sending an army against your various armies. But when you do defeat them, like, everyone joins on you. And then you get to unleash uh, the force against uh, the Castorves. And then you have the bat. Then you could have a battle against Razov. Where, like, Drazov is, you know, throwing all the might and power of the cast dwarves against the Greenskins. And he might succeed even um, army one army against another. But then just Grimgor is, has become a deity, more or less, w with the winds inside them and the power of Gork and Mork, really, um, inside them. And he just basically topples the walls of the Black Fortress and w if, uh, secures victory. And then you have the Beast Wah unifying the hobgoblins, the greenskins, the regular greenskins, and the ogres, just a vast army marching on Tsar Nagrund, where it's only really, uh, they win through because of the, uh, the backstabbing nature of the hobgoblins who decide to be betray their cast dwarf master. So, there's a lot of potential there. Like, if that doesn't sound interesting to you, if you think that you can't have a series of interesting battles and an interesting campaign map with that. Well, I don't know what to say. It could be interesting, but not if Creative Assembly treats a more limited campaign as just like, oh, a smaller map, same, dy same campaign ma dynamics. No, it needs to be objective-focused. Uh, it needs to have multiple choices. Like, hey, maybe you just decide, you know what, I'm not going to. Like, uh, just using that example that I gave, uh, like, a potential Grimgor campaign in a limited fashion, because that's exactly, by the way, what Grimgor did in the end times. Just using that particular example, like, maybe you don't ally the ogres, for instance, and you might get some other benefits. Maybe you do have other things, like, just also going Grimgor, he also went to Cafe, where 
he helped Kofi. Like maybe you could have different choices. Maybe you don't form the Beast Wall. Maybe you just decide, you know, I'm not interested in those ogres. Just butcher them all. Maybe you get various benefits for that. Or maybe with the Hobgoblins, you just don't want to deal with them because, well, Greenskins would hate the Hobgoblins because of their previous betrayal. So there is the possibility. And that's just something I literally made up thinking about like what someone like Grimgor had done. Like you think of other characters. You think of Ungrim. You think of uh, Ikiklaw. You think of Ma even Manfred. Yes, Despicable Manfred. You think of Vlad. You think of the stories they had in the end times. You think that it's not possible to uh, portray those stories with like missions or smaller campaign maps that focus on their stories and the dynamics of those stories and the decisions they made in those stories. It is very possible. But not like this. Now with just a limited map where you're constantly fighting non-stop battles against armies that the AI is just constantly building. That wouldn't be a great experience. One of the reasons I liked Napoleon is like, yes, the AI built armies, but there were a set of very specific battles that you had to fight in those campaigns uh, in order to win. Now, replayability, of course, would be something that's limited, to be sure, unless Creative Assembly gave you a, a wide variety of choices and consequences for those choices uh, in order to spi uh, spice things up or multiple campaigns. Like maybe you have a campaign map that's like, well, you could play as Draza trying to stop uh, Grumgor. You could play as Greasus trying to uh, s uh, stop Grumgor. Hell, even this Skaven could play a role in that because they were attacking the Great Bastion until Grimgor showed up and, well, hilarity en ensued. But that's just where I stand on this. Let me know what you guys think. Questine signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.